This can be enough. All right, I want to review a little bit, because I know a lot of you weren't here last time. Uh, we started talking about a judicial branch, Article 2 of the Constitution sets up the judicial branch of the United States. Uh, actually, the Constitution of the United States only set up one court, which would be the U.S. Supreme Court in Article 3. However, it gave Congress the ability to do what? To create or form lower courts as it deems fit. So over the years, as the United States expanded, Congress was able to create more federal courts because that's a power given to it by the Constitution of the United States. So in the United States, we have a Supreme Court, which is established by the Constitution of the United States, but we also have Circuit Court of Appeals, and we also have District Courts or Trial Courts, um, which were created by Congress. And we talked about how independent the federal court is. Give me things that makes our federal court system independent from outside influences. They can be removed from the court. The judges and justices are. They're not. Uh, so a lot of you put this on your on your homework that they cannot be removed. You could remove them. There's it's a way to. Difficult. But it's just very difficult to. Yeah. It's very difficult to remove them. They're not what. What else but makes them independent? Elected. They're not elected, so they don't have to care about what people think. They are what. Appointed. They're appointed, appointed. by um, the president of the United States and confirmed by the Senate. There is one way to remove them. What is that? Impeachment. What is a very difficult thing to do? And how long do they get to serve? Life. life. They get to serve for life. So all those things makes the judges and justices of the federal courts relatively immune from public pressures and from the pressures of the executive branch, the president of the United States, and Congress. Uh, once they're in there, there's very little the outside forces can do to affect their decision. And according to Federalist Number 78, written by Alexander Hamilton, that's okay because the judicial branch is what? It's the weakest of all the branches. It doesn't have power over the sword of the purse, over the economy, or the military. It cannot even do what to its own decisions. Enforce it. It cannot even enforce its own decisions. It has to rely on the other branches to do that. So to the, uh, it has to rely on the presidency. It has to rely on Congress to be able to enforce its own decisions. If you all remember, Worcester versus Georgia, um, Andrew Jackson refused to enforce a decision made by the courts in that case. All right, now we talked about Marr versus Madison. Uh, Marr versus Madison established that the judicial branch of the United States can do what? Uh, judicial review. They can determine whether or not something is what? Constitutional, constitutional or unconstitutional. They can determine whether a legislation passed by Congress or something that's done by the states or something that's done by the President of the United States is, con is in agreement with the Constitution. If they don't think that it's in agreement with the Constitution, they can strike it down, they can declare it unconstitutional, which is what judicial review is. Any questions so far? So move on. Let's talk about Unit 2, Lesson 10. In the courts right now, in the federal court system, especially the Supreme Court, very important decisions are getting made by our federal courts. And these decisions are influenced by a variety of factors. They are, these judges and justices are still human beings, and their decisions are affected. Now, this branch, or the judges and the justices of the federal court, are not supposed to be politically swayed. That's the whole idea of making them independent. However, political ideology and par uh, political parties affect their decisions. Each one of these members of, uh, of the federal courts, the judges and the justices of the federal courts, they have a, an ideology, they have a political ideology, which means the, they have values and beliefs about politics. Some of them are conservatives, some of them are liberals, and these affect their decisions. So the ideology of the individual judges and the individual justices can affect their decisions. Again, ideology means the values and the beliefs of these judges and justices. They have an impact on what they will decide. Usually, conservative judges hand out conservative decisions, and liberal judges hand out liberal decisions. It does have an impact. Their party affiliation have an impact also. Most of these judges and justices are either Republican or they're Democrat, and their decisions get affected the same way. Democratic judges are usually more liberal, Republican judges are usually more conservative, and they hand out decisions that way also. So their ideologies, their political affiliations, these affect what kind of decisions are being made in the federal courts today. It certainly affects the confirmation process. Um, Republican, judge, um, Republican presidents usually appoint what kind of judges? Republican judges. And um, Democratic uh, presidents usually appoint Democratic judges and justices. So it affects the confirmation process. If I was Donald Trump, 
what I want in a federal judge is somebody that believes the same way as I do. So I'm a conservative, so I'm going to appoint somebody who's also conservative. I'm going to appoint somebody who's also a Republican. So that when they're making decisions, they will make decisions that I would have made. However, oftentimes, they're disappointed with their choices. Um, and oftentimes, they thought they're getting a liberal judge in there or a conservative judge in there, but they make decisions who are opposite of those beliefs and ideologies. Case in point, in the 1950s, uh, President Eisenhower appointed Justice Earl Warren to the Supreme Court. He put him on the bench, and he thought he was going to get somebody who's conservative, who has the same values as he does. But once he gets to the Supreme Court, he starts handing out very liberal decisions in the Supreme Court. So he, got, he was disappointed with that pick. But the problem the presidents have, and this is in Alexander Hamilton 78, what can they do to affect the decisions made by their appointees once they're in there? Nothing. They can't kick them out because they're there for life. They're not elected. They're appointed by the president. And once they're in there, it is very difficult to remove them. So there's nothing Eisenhower can do about it. He thought he was getting himself a conservative in the Supreme Court, but this guy starts handing out liberal decisions and there's nothing he can do about it. That's why presidents have to be very careful who they put on the bench, who they put in the Supreme Court. They have to, be, they have to know um, what's in their hearts. Because what's, well, oh boy, once they're in there, there's nothing they can do. All right, this is the composition of our current Supreme Court right now. Um, if you're a conservative in this class, good news for you, you have a majority in the Supreme Court. Uh, if you're a liberal, it's bad news for you, you have a minority. It's a 5-4 um, Supreme Court right now. Five conservative justices, which are usually Republican, and four liberal or Democratic ju justices in the Supreme Court right now. So, what can you expect? What kind of decisions can you expect from the Supreme Court? Conservative, conservative decisions. Are they sitting? Like conservative sitting down in the No. Uh, <laughs> Justice Ginsburg is a liberal. Oh. He's, you know, he's a conservative. He's <laughs> uh, is is the one from Ron 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 Reagan? Oh, he got out. He retired. That's what allowed um, that allowed Donald Trump to appoint this guy right here. Well, <laughs> so we have these two were appointed by Donald Trump. Oh, I can tell. And she's about to croak, so. Oh. <laughs> Which means this, guys. If she does retire or does die while Donald Trump is in office, she is a liberal. This is Justice Ginsburg. I think she's like 85 years old right now. Which means if she doesn't survive the Donald Trump presidency, um, you're going to have a 6 3 majority Republican or conservative majority, which is good news for conservatives. Very bad news for the liberals. Because again, once they're in there, they're in there for life. And the Senate's going to like push because. Sorry? Like the Senate's going to push, like they're not going to do the little lame dunk. Exactly. Lame dunk. Because they have a Republican majority. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Alright, another thing that affects our decisions are past cases. Past cases affect our judges and justices' decisions. And this is what we call the principle of star decisis. We talk about Supreme Court cases in this class not because of their importance in that moment of history. We talk about them because they're going to have an impact. Because usually, the courts of the federal courts, they usually base their decisions on a previous case that have a similar situation. So for example, if the courts today encounter something about abortion, they usually look towards Roe versus Wade, and they look at the decision made by the courts at Roe versus Wade, and they apply it to the current case. So looking at cases, especially in this class, is important, not because of what happened in that particular moment of history. It's because it's going to have an impact on future cases. Because what courts usually do is they take a decision made by a previous court and they apply it to a similar situation. That's why it's important to look at past cases in US history. All right, so this is the principle called stare decisis. In Latin, it roughly translates to let the decision stand. Let the previous court decision stand in this case. So the principle of binding president, decision or higher court is binding on a lower court, the decision must be followed, blah, blah, blah. It basically means that courts today are bound by previous court decisions. That usually they follow what they decided before. And you need to know this word, presidents. 
which spelled with a C-E, presidents, are rules or guidelines established by a case. Rules or guidelines established by a decision. And these presidents are often applied to current cases. So rules or guidelines established by a decision. So court cases are important not because of their impact right there and then, it's because they establish a precedent that future cases or future courts will follow. So again, a precedent is a rule or a guideline established by a case. And these rules or guidelines are always are often adopted and applied to similar cases in the future. So I'll give you an example. What was the precedent established in Baker versus Carr? What did the Supreme Court establish in Baker v. Carr? Discrimination to do what? To have an equal what? Districts. Districts. One person, one what? Vote. One person, one vote. But that was a rule established in Baker versus Carr. When a court experiences another case that are similar to that, what are they going to do? They're going to refer to that rule, they're going to refer to that president, and apply that president in their current case. Does that make sense? That's why it's important to look at cases in this class because they establish rules, they establish precedent that future cases will follow, the future courts will follow. So in Baker versus Carr, they establish the precedent of one person, one, <coughs> one person, one vote, which they can use in similar cases in the future. Those of you that study U.S. history, which is all of you, what rule or precedent was established by Plessy versus Ferguson? <laughs> All right. Let's see versus Ferguson is about the 14th Amendment. It's the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause, which states that no state can do what? Discriminate, can discriminate on people. Um, Plessy versus uh, Ferguson, I think it was in Louisiana. Oh, yes, the restaurant, right? There were two rail cars. No, never mind. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. This is a time of Jim Crow, it's a time of segregation. So there's oh, white okay. rail cars and colored rail cars or black rail cars, a black man named Plessy complained that this is his state discriminating on him. This is his state treating him unequally. So that would be a violation of what? The 14th, the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. The Supreme Court hands out this president. The president says, segregation does not equal discrimination. Just because you're separating people, it doesn't mean you're discriminating on them. If those two cars are exactly the same, there is no discrimination. So there's no violation of what? The 14th, 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. So any case dealing with segregating races will refer to that president, which says uh, separate but equal is OK. It's not a violation of the 14th Amendment uh, when they're evaluating a case that has to do with segregation. So the president established here is separate but equal is OK. It's not a violation of the 14th Amendment. That president is going to have impact decades after Plessy versus Ferguson. Because this is going to allow states to have segregation in schools, segregation in public places, segregation in parks, segregation in water fountains. That president is going to be used in future cases. So if a court, for example, comes across a similar case, let's say it's about water fountains now, all they have to do is look at that previous case in Plessy versus Ferguson and apply it to the current case. The president was, what's okay? Separate. Segregation is okay. Separate but equal is okay. So they're going to apply that into the f a future case. This president makes sense now. What are presidents? They're what? Rules or guidelines, Rules or guidelines established by a case that future courts will what? Follow. Will follow and apply to similar cases. Does that make sense? Yes. So, star decisis and presidents are pretty much the same thing. All stare decisis is, is when a court uses a president established by a previous case, they're practicing stare decisis. Does that make sense? When a court uses a president established by a previous case on to a current case, they're practicing the doctrine of stare decisis. They're letting the decision stand. Any questions? So that's another thing that affects um, the decisions made by the courts. So let's talk about overturning presidents. Presidents are not solid. They're not permanent. They can be overturned. Usually, a lower court president can be overturned by a higher court president. So let's say this court right here makes a decision. Since they're the lowest one, 
these presidents are the most vulnerable because a higher court can overturn them. Anything can be overturned by who? The Supreme Court. By the Supreme Court, because they're the what? The highest. the highest court. So a lower court president can be overturned by a higher court president. A lower court president can be overturned by a higher court president. Which begs the question, what question does it beg? Who can do what? Who can overturn Supreme Court decisions? If the Supreme Court is the highest court of the land, is their decisions, are their decisions, are their presidents final? Are they always there? And they're never going to be changed. Do we have segregation today? No. No. So what's the answer? Yeah. Yes, they can be changed. Who can change? Who can overturn presidents made by the Supreme Court? Another Supreme Court. Presidents established by the Supreme Court can only be overturned by who? By themselves. So Supreme Court presidents can be overturned by the Supreme Court or by themselves. And this is why who becomes president of the United States matters. Not just for the ex executive branch, not just for the execution of policy and foreign policy. It matters for the other branch. It matters for the judicial branch. Because he gets to decide who's going to be part of the judicial branch. And what happens in the judicial branch all the time, not just in the Supreme Court, but in the other lower federal courts, is the dominant or majority ideology is constantly changing. Sometimes the Supreme Court is more liberal, sometimes the Supreme Court is more conservative. Right now our Supreme Court is what? Conservative. conservative. But if we get a string of democratic presidents, what's probably going to happen? No a lot of those justices will die off, or a lot of them will retire, and those presidents get to appoint new ones in there. And then the Supreme Court will morph and become more liberal. So over the years in the United States, it's constantly shifting back and forth between a Supreme Court that's liberal and a Supreme Court that's conservative. That's why presidents are not permanent because they can always be overturned. Something that was established by a conservative Supreme Court can be overturned by a liberal one. That's why a lot of liberals right now are very scared about gay marriage. There was a president established that gay marriage is, is okay. Roe versus Wade established that what is also okay? Abortion. Abortion is also okay. These are in danger because the Supreme Court can overturn its own president. Now that we have a more conservative Supreme Court, those liberal decisions made in the past can be overturned by a more conservative Supreme Court. Does this make sense? Yeah. So, it be like re-overturned? Yes. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So, this constant, make sure to remember the Supreme Court and the other, uh, the other courts of the United States federal government, uh, there's a constant shifting of the dominant ideology. Sometimes it's more conservative, sometimes it's more liberal. Right now, it's a little bit more what? It's a little bit more conservative. It's on that side of the spectrum. Yes, ma'am? So, Lisa, I thought they were like immune to the political side of But they, if they themselves are political, right, they can't be immune from themselves. So does that make sense? They still have their own values, they still have their own beliefs, and they usually use those to make decisions. Anybody have any questions? Yes. All right, this is your current make of the Supreme Court. Let's move on. What used to be before Anthony Kennedy retired is even though he was a conservative justice, he would sometimes make liberal decisions. So what happened back then is, when you guys were four years ago, we had four liberals, four conservatives, and one guy that, co that can go either way. Sometimes he goes liberal, sometimes he goes conservative. In the gay marriage case, he went liberal. That's why gay marriage is legalized all over the 50 states right now. The problem liberals have is, this guy retired, and the guy who got to replace him is a what? Conservative. He's a conservative, so he replaced him with somebody who's very conservative. So now we have a 5-4 um, Supreme Court. So if you want to take a look at the guy that replaced Anthony, uh, Anthony Kennedy, the guy that Donald Trump chose, um, if Kennedy was right here, right in the middle, sometimes you go liberal, sometimes you go conservative, Brett Kavanaugh's right here, which means he's very, to the right, he's very conservative. Wait, so did you say that there's always a swing vote, or it was just that one time? No, just with Kennedy, Anthony Kennedy sometimes goes liberal and sometimes goes conservative. So it was a special kind of Supreme Court where things were more exciting. That's cool. 
but he usually gets to decide things because one, the other four people would go one way and four people would go another way and he's usually deciding both. But now it's going to be conservative. Any questions? So if you want an example of presidents being overturned, what overturned Plessy versus Ferguson? Brown versus Board of Education. So Plessy versus Ferguson was in 1896. And then 50 years later, we had Brown versus Board of Education, which said separate but equal is inherently unequal, which means that it's against which, which amendment? The 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. So an example would be Brown overturning Plessy. And what allowed that to happen is between 1896, where the, where the Supreme Court was more conservative, in which they wanted the states to be able to decide their own destiny. If they want to discriminate, that's fine with the Supreme Court because they thought it wasn't their job to dictate that. We had a string of Democratic presidents. We had FDR for three terms, and then we had his replacement. Who replaced him? Who replaced FDR? After he died. Oh, Truman. what? Uh, no. Sorry, somebody said it. Truman. Truman. So Truman comes into office. So we have two Democratic presidents. Um, that were able to appoint more liberal justices in there, and by the time 1953 hits, we have a very liberal Supreme Court, and they were able to overturn um, the decision made by Plessy versus Ferguson. Any questions? It's not that conservatives are racist. We'll talk about that later. All right, the last thing that affects Supreme Court decisions or the decisions made by judges and justices. Oh, by the way, what's the difference between a judge and a justice before I move on? Justices are also judge, judges, but they have a very important position that they get to serve in the highest court of the land, which is what? Supreme, Supreme Court. Court. So justices are just judges that get to be in the Supreme Court. The nine judges of the Supreme Court are all known as justices. So there's only nine judges? Yes. Well, there's state supreme courts, and we call we also call those guys justices, but they're state justices. Mm -hmm. All right. Like I told you before, decisions can be very powerful that have sweeping consequences. The thing is, a lot of these supreme court decisions, if powerful enough, can act like legislation. And who's the one that's supposed to be making legislation in the United States? Congress. Congress is supposed to be the one making legislation, along with the President of the United States, and the state legislatures, the state governments, are supposed to be the one making legislation. So there's this different attitudes about what the Supreme Court or what the court should be able to do. Some people are okay with the Supreme Court making these very impactful decisions that have lasting consequences that act like legislation. And some people were not okay with that because they think the Supreme Court should relegate themselves or should restrain themselves from making policy at all, because that's not their job. So we have two different kinds of philosophies, and depending on what kind of judge you are, this is gonna affect the decisions that you make in the Supreme Court and in the other federal courts. So there's two types of philosophy, judicial activism and judicial restraint. You need to know the differences between the two. Some judges and justices are judicial activists. Some judges and justices are people that believe in judicial restraint. And as you grow up, you're gonna need to figure out for yourself which one of these two philosophies would you rather have your judges have. So let's talk about judicial activism first. Judicial activists, or judges that believe in judicial activism, are not afraid to create policy with their power. With their position as a judge or a justice of federal court, they're not afraid to make policy changes. They don't think that power just belongs to Congress or that belongs to the states. They want to actively create policy. They're not afraid to create policy with their decisions. Oh, by the way, um, before we move on, how does a decision create a policy? Like, for example, in Roe versus Wade, most of the states in the United States back then, before Roe versus Wade, had banned what? Abortion, including Texas, where this thing happened in Roe versus Wade. The Supreme Court says, no, abortion should be legal everywhere in the United States. That's a policy. That pretty much has the same power as a what? As a law, only it's more powerful because it covers all 50 states of the United States. And for judicial activists, that's okay. 
it's okay for a judge or a justice or it's okay for the courts to make decisions like that. So it's okay for them to make policy. It's okay for them to, to exercise, what's that power? To strike down laws and let's boldly strike down unconstitutional laws. They're not afraid to use their judicial review power. They're not afraid to just strike down laws passed by the states, passed by Congress. If they feel like it's unconstitutional, they don't restrain themselves from striking them down and using judicial review. Because they feel like that's their job. Their job is to seek out unconstitutional laws, unconstitutional actions, and strike them down. So boldly strike down legislation and establish and create new policies. They're okay, I'm sorry, new presidents. They are okay with establishing new presidents. Just like what the court did in Roe versus Wade, where they established the president of abortion should be legal everywhere in the United States, people that believe in judicial activism think that it's okay for the courts to establish new presidents. Not just blindly following presidents of the past, but establishing your own, overturning previous ones if you, if you have to. Especially if it is done to promote a social cause, if it's done to promote social progress in the United States. If it's done to promote social progress in the United States, this is what the court did in Brown versus Board of Education. They struck down a law to promote social change in the United States. That's judicial activism. This is what happened in 2015 when they struck down um, laws that would make it illegal to have gay marriage. That's judicial activism. They're okay with using their power, they're okay with using their position to promote social progress in the United States. And when it comes to interpreting the Constitution, people that believe in judicial activism apply modern day values and modern day sensibilities to their decisions. They apply modern day values and modern day sensibilities and sometimes their own values and sometimes their own sensibilities when making a decision. They feel that the Constitution is a living, breathing document that can be interpreted throughout time with the values of that modern day society. I know some of you are confused, but it's gonna become more clear once we contrast it with the next one, which is judicial restraint. For people that believe in judicial restraint, policy making should not up be it should not up should not be up to the courts. They should leave it up to who? Congress. The Congress and the states. That's their job, that's not our job. Policy making is not our job. That's a role that we weren't made to play. Leave policymaking to the policymakers, to Congress, to the states, not to the courts. That's not the court's job. If change must happen, then let Congress do it and let the states do it, not the courts. And if judicial activists are very bold in their use of their judicial review, people that believe in judicial restraint are very cautious of their use of judicial review. And they believe only obviously unconstitutional laws are, should be overturned. If it's obviously unconstitutional, those are the things that we can target with our judicial review. Otherwise, we should be very careful in using judicial review. And I want you to understand the reasoning why and the people that support judicial restraint. What is the difference between Congress and state legislatures that create this legislation and the Supreme Court? What's the difference? How come people that believe in judicial restraint feel like Congress and the state legislatures have the right to make legislation, have the right to make policy, and the court doesn't? Because they're elected. And judges and justices of the Supreme Court should not just be striking down laws created by an elected body like Congress, willy-nilly. Only obviously unconstitutional laws should be struck down because they are not elected. Congress and state legislatures, those guys are elected. They have the right to make laws. So we shouldn't be striking those down willy-nilly because they were created by people who are elected into office, unlike the judicial branch, which aren't elected into office. 
And the role that people that believe in judicial restraint thinks that courts should have is a referee role. They should limit themselves to a referee role. The whole idea why a judicial branch exists is to play referee about the Constitution. That's their job. Not to make policy, not to make legislation, but to play a referee. To figure out if something is constitutional or unconstitutional, that's it. They're not supposed to be making sweeping policy changes. They're not supposed to be making legislation. Their job is to become the arbiter of the Constitution of the United States. They're the, rule, they're, they're, they're the people that know the rule book, which is the Constitution. And if people that believe in judicial activism think that the court should be actively creating new presidents and overturning old ones, what do people that believe in judicial restraint believe? Follow old presidents. They don't want the courts to be making changes in the United States. So they prefer that the courts follow presidents instead of establishing new ones. And while people that believe in judicial activism are okay with the courts interpreting the Constitution using their own values or using modern day values, people that believe in judicial restraint believe in strict constructionism. And you need to know what that word means. Strict constructionism. Anybody can guess what that means. How should a judge interpret the Constitution? If not based on modern day and his own values, how should a judge do it? Exactly what it says, based on whose interpretation of the Constitution? The framers of the Constitution. The original intent of the framers of the Constitution. That's how they should be basing their decision. Not on what they feel, not what on their, their own values, but they should be interpreting the Constitution the way it was originally meant to be interpreted by James Madison and by our founding fathers. That is strict constructionism. If you put down the word original intent, you'll remember it. Framers of the Constitution, that's how we should be interpreting it. And what can give us an insight on what our framers meant with the words that they wrote? The Fellows Papers, right? The Fellows Papers gives us an insight on what, the, uh, what they meant with the words that they wrote. All right. But here's the main difference. As a judge, because as a human being, you have policy goals. You have things that you want government to do and you want to make changes in the United States. The difference between a judicial activist and a judicial, uh, somebody that believes in judicial restraint is a judicial activist is not afraid to use his position to promote that goal, to achieve that goal, to use judicial review, to use his position in the court to promote that goal. While somebody that believes in judicial restraint thinks, that's not our job. I may have a goal, I may have a policy goal, but that's not the job of the courts. Our job is to determine whether or not something is what? Constitutional or unconstitutional, our job is not to make changes in the United States. We need to leave that to the other branches because that's not how we were made. Well, that's not the reason why we were made. However, judicial activism in the United States, even though some people think it's unconstitutional to do that, that this is the courts playing a role they're not supposed to be playing. This is them playing policymaker when they're supposed to be the ones that's just arbitrary. They're just playing a referee role. But judicial activism in this country have promoted a lot of changes. Civil rights wouldn't have been possible without judicial activists. Gay marriage equality in the United States wouldn't have been possible without judicial activists. Um, it would have been very, very slow to achieve all those things if it weren't for judicial activism. So when you grow up, well, as you grow up, you're going to need to decide for yourself, what do you want in the courts? Do you want a court that's just um, neutral in the Constitution, that's not promoting anything? Or do you want judges and justices that are actively seeking to improve the United States and using their position and their power to improve the United States? Um, something else that is in support of judicial activism. Judicial activists are not afraid to interpret the Constitution according to modern day values. While people that believe in judicial restraint believe that we should only interpret it according to our founding fathers. What's the problem with that? Things have changed. Things have changed. If it were up to our founding fathers, we would still have slavery. If it were up to our founding fathers, women wouldn't be able to vote in the United States. Things have changed, values have evolved, morality has evolved, and according to people that believe in judicial activism, judges should be able to evolve with it, and the, con the interpretation of the Constitution should be able to evolve with it. 
But again, these are things that you need to struggle with as you're growing. What kind of judge do you want in the bench in the Supreme Court? A couple of examples in the 1950s and the 1970s, like I said, we've had two very liberal judicial um, Supreme Court. Oh, by the way, before we move on, Supreme Courts are named after the Chief Justice, which is the leader of the court at the time. There are nine justices of the Supreme Court. Eight of them are called Associate Justices and one is called the Chief Justice. Whoever is the Chief Justice during a period of time, that's what the, the court is named after. So the Chief Justice during the 1950s and the 1960s are Earl Warren and Wer Warren Burger. <coughs> so we call the courts Warren Court and the Burger Court. These are very um, judicial activist courts. And they were seekingly, they were making very important decisions and very sweeping changes to the United States with the decisions that they made. So this is the court that did Brown versus Board, Board of Education, Miranda versus Arizona, Mapp versus Ohio, things that we're going to hear about in this class. But these courts were not afraid to use their power, to use judicial review um, to achieve a goal, to promote civil rights. But then in the 1980s and towards the 2000s, the court will become more restrained. As more conservative justices, Oh, by the way, judicial activism is usually associated with liberalism, and judicial restraint is usually um, associated with conservatism. However, that's not always the case. There's some <coughs> conservative judges who are activists, and there's some liberal judge justices who are people that, who believe in restraint. But usually, that is the case. And then, 1980s and the and the 2000s, we have the Rehnquist Court, where we have a bunch of conservative justices in the Supreme Court, and a lot of them want it to be more restrained. <clears throat> Any questions so far? So let's compare them, guys, because it's important to know the difference between the two. And on your FRQ, you're going to need to explain it to me. Judicial activism and judicial restraint. When it comes to presidents, people that believe in judicial activism are OK with doing what? Overturning. We're overturning and what? Creating and creating new ones, setting presidents. So they're okay with setting new presidents and they're okay with overturning old ones. Especially if it helps promote something and it helps progress the United States. What about if you believe in judicial restraint? What do you believe about presidents? Follow, Follow old ones. Don't be making new ones. Don't be changing the United States by a lot. Follow old ones. That's not our job. All right, when it comes to judicial review, who's not afraid to use judicial review? Sorry. Judicial activities. While for people that believe in judicial restraint, only use it when the law is obviously what? Unconstitutional. Unconstitutional. Sparingly use it. Don't use it all the time. Sparingly use it. Because remember, the people that created these laws are elected. We're not elected. The people chose them. We weren't chosen by the people. All right. What's the role of the court? If you believe in judicial restraint, what's the role of the court? You're just a referee. You're there to settle questions about the Constitution. But if you believe in judicial activism, you, you are okay with using your role to promote progress in the United States, promote social progress in the U.S. Interpretation. If you're a judicial, somebody believe in judicial restraint, how do you interpret the Constitution? Constructionism, Constructionism according to who? The framers, according to the original intent of the framers. If you believe in judicial activism, how do you interpret the Constitution? Modern, Modern day values, using your own values, using your own sensibilities when you're interpreting the Constitution. Any questions? That graph is your heart and soul, guys. Make sure that you know how to fill that up in your head. And you know the difference between the two philosophies. Wait, what was it for judicial restraint. Their, uh, its original intent, which means they follow what the founding fathers intended. While for judicial activism, they believe that they can interpret the Constitution their own way or, or using modern day values or modern day sensibilities. That the Constitution is a living, breathing document that it should be interpreted that way. Anybody else have a question? Roll the court, you're a referee. You settle disputes about the Constitution. That's your, that's your job. That's all you can do. 
Sorry? Um, uh, precedents? Judicial activism are not afraid to establish new presidents and overturn old ones while people that believe in judicial restraint um, they stick to the old ones and they follow the old ones and they apply old presidents. Alright, so over time guys, as you grow up, you're going to encounter very controversial Supreme Court decisions, perhaps in your lifetime, and you may not have been aware of it. In 2015, they decided, the court decided to legalize gay marriage all over the United States. That was your Roe versus Wade of your lifetime, even though you may not have been aware of the case. That case is going to have impact in the, in the coming decades. Um, but whenever a controversial decision like that is handed out, like Roe versus Wade and Obergefell versus Hodges, gay marriage case, uh, people usually accuse the Supreme Court, especially people that disagree with the Supreme Court's decision of being judicial activists. And in the United States today, judicial activism is a dirty word. It usually means that as a judge, you are playing a role that you're not supposed to be playing. Somebody who's unelected like you shouldn't be making sweeping policy decisions like that. But judicial activism, and you're going to notice this a lot, judicial activism is in the eye of the beholder. And usually, if somebody disagrees with a ruling, they call it judicial activism. <coughs> if they're okay with the ruling, they don't say anything. But that's usually the case. Even if, even if you're a liberal or you're a conservative, if you disagree with a court decision, they usually accuse them of being judicial activists, which means playing a role they're not supposed to be playing. And you're going to see that a lot as you grow up. It's, more conservative decisions, I mean, more um, controversial decisions get handed out. So I'll show you a video. This is right after the gay marriage case decision was handed down. And this is um, about your senator, Ted Cruz. Week 